Paul. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Bow. Yes, Martin. Can we begin? Hare Krishna Maharaj. The Lord Pranath. Om Magyana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Nilitanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Panchakaupa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we're continuing our study of um, Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6. This is at the level of Bhakti Vaibhav. And we are on chapter number... Chapter number 10. Right? Chapter 10. So we were hearing, we were hearing how the demigods were in difficulty and they, they had offended Brihaspati, Brihaspati had left them. So Lord Brahma told them they needed a guru. So he suggested to them that they take Vishwarup for their guru. But he warned them that Vishwarup has some affection also for the demons. Anyway, they accepted Vishwarup as their guru, and Vishwarup gave them the Narayana Kavacha. And with the help of the Narayana Kavacha, they were able to protect themselves. And then, then we heard about the demigods wanted, or, or the, what happened was Vishwarup was offering oblations to the demons. And Indra found out, Indra understood that he was offering these oblations to the demons, and Indra cut off his three heads. So Vishwarup was a Brahmana. He was the son of Twasta, and Twasta was from Kashyapa and Aditi. So he was a Brahmana. So killing a Brahmana is very serious, and Indra suffered offense. He, he suffered, he had to undergo great suffering for one year, and then afterwards, then he divided that suffering to others. To, he gave it to water, and he gave it to earth, and he gave it to women, and he gave it to trees because they'd all given him something, so he gave them something, he, he let them take some of his karma for him. And this way Indra was relieved to some extent of the sinful reactions. But the sinful reaction was still there in a subtle way and it came forth again because later on he killed another Brahmana. He killed Vritasura. So we're going to hear, um, well, first of all, what happened was after Lord Indra had killed uh, Vishwarup, the father of Vishwarup, Twasta, was very angry and he created 
Vritasura. And the purpose of Vritasura was to, to kill Indra, but instead of killing Indra, he produced somebody who was Indra's enemy. And so <laughs> it turned, turned out Indra killed him. Indra became the killer because he, the Twastak chanted the mantra wrong. So when Vritasura appeared, the demigods were very fearful and they didn't know how to ever fight against this demon Vritasura because he was so gigantic and he was so powerful. When they threw their weapons at him, he just swallowed them. He just, he just died. He just had them. They're nothing to him. So they went to, they prayed to the Supreme Lord and the Lord, they, initially they asked the Lord to kill the demon for, for them. But the Lord said, no, he said, you have to kill him yourself. He said, I'm not going to kill the demon for, because the demon's a Brahmana and the Brahmanas are very dear to the Lord. So the demigods want to kill him, they have to kill this Brahmana themselves. Of course, he's in the form of a big demon. So he told them how to do it, and he told them that you can go to, you can go to, yeah, you can go to Dadichi. And Dadichi, have you been to Dadichi Muni's ashram? It's in Naimasharanya. If you go to Naimisharanya, you can see it just near to, just on the side of Naimisharanya, very near to where the sages all gathered for performing sacrifice, yagya. So Dadichi Muni, there's an ashram there where Dadichi Muni was staying many years ago, many millions of years ago, because we hear this battle which took place between the demigods and the demons, this was at the end of Satya Yuga and the beginning of Treta Yuga. This is when the battle took place. So, they, we're going to hear now how the demigods approached the Dichi. They were told, the Lord told them that this the Dichi, his body is very powerful because he's done a lot of austerity and he's very, very pure. So you have to go and ask him for his body, for the bones from his body. You know, an unusual request. Somebody comes and, yes, what can I do for you? Can you kindly give me the bones from your body, my dear sir? You know, an unusual request to ask someone to give the bones from their body. Anyway, the demigods, this is what they have to do because there's no way they can kill Vritasura. And Lord Vishnu said he's not going to kill him for them. He said they have to kill the demon themselves. But he said, you get the bones from Dadichi and then Vishwakarma will make a Vajra, a Vajra, a weapon, and you can use that weapon to kill Vritasura. So this is what happens. So we're, the chapter goes on, we're going to hear how the demigods approach Dadichi. Right? Um, well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just open the text and we'll, we'll share it with everyone. You can see for yourself. Maybe you haven't read the text so well. Okay, so Sukadeva Goswami is describing, right? After instructing Indra, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Hari, uh, disappeared from the demigods. So the, the Lord left them and Indra is left on his own and he has to go to Dadichi. Well, he's with the other demigods and they go to see Dadichi. And he's described, Dadichi is described, he was very liberal. And when they begged him to give them his body, he at once partially agreed. However, just to hear religious instructions from them, 
he, smi he smiled and jokingly told, and he tells them, you know, don't you know the body is the thing we're most attached to? Don't you know? And when he talks about the, the time of death and the pain which is there with the body, giving up the body, it's interesting to read, right? He's telling the demigods, as if the demigods don't know, of course they know, but demigods, they don't have this kind of fear. They don't have to worry about pain at the time of death. It's only for us humans. We know about these on this planet. We know about, we have to experience these things. So severe pain at the time of death takes away the consciousness of all living entities who have material bodies. Don't you know about this pain? <laughs> and then the conversation goes on, Dadichi Muni is speaking, how everybody in the material world is struggling to keep their body alive. We, do, we go to great efforts to try to keep the body alive, right? We will do many things different, we will accept different diets to keep the body alive. We will go to doctors, we will try so many different things. People will do exercises, they will do so many different austerities just to try to keep life in the body. So, Dadichi says, who would be prepared to deliver his body to anyone, even if it were demanded by Lord Vishnu? Dadichi is saying nobody's going to give up their body very easily. And in the purport, Prabhupada speaks about, he quotes, he quotes a Sanskrit statement from the, uh, from the Dharma Shastras. He's, it says, one must protect his body by all means, then he may protect his religious principles and thereafter his possessions. Oh. So the body, the body is the thing we're most attached to and we can, we can sacrifice our material possessions just like if there's a building, if, if your house is on fire, you know when the house is on fire then you're going to get out of the house. Or if you're in an aeroplane, you're in the aeroplane and the plane's going to crash, they tell you, leave your bag there. Don't try to bring your bags with you. <laughs> you know, when we go in the aeroplane, you carry bags. But if you have to get out in a crash landing, they say, just leave your bag. Don't worry about your luggage, just leave it. Just get off the plane. In other words, save the body. The body is more important than your possessions. Right? Well, that's common. But, but more important than possessions are also religious principles. But religious principles are not as important as the body. Even for the sake of our body, we may give up religious principles. In order to save our body, we may have to give up religious principles. Can you think of any examples like this in scriptures where somebody gave up their religious principles to save their body? Arjuna gave up his religious principles to save his body. Not to save his body. You think Arjuna was only interested to save his body? Is that why, why he... No, no. He wanted to save all, the, all others from the opposite side, as well as from his side. What, what? Well, Arjuna, he, he, he didn't give up, the, he may have gave up some 
the material religious principles, but the ultimate religious principle was surrender to Krishna. So he didn't give up that, right? The ultimate principle of religion is to take shelter of Krishna. So Arjuna taught us that example, that to give up other principles of religion, but that was why he fought. He fought because Krishna wanted him to fight. It's a, I, it's a bit difficult for me to apply that case of Arjuna to this point here, that religious principles, huh? Hare Maharaj, Hare Krishna. Maharaj, can we uh, take a Janina in this case? He has given up his religious principles to save his body or to maintain his body. Okay, Ar Anjamila, what was he doing? He was. In what way did he give up his religious principles? Uh, he has given up all his uh, uh, rituals, his sadhanas, his family, all the, uh, his family or whatever the sadhanas he was doing, being a brahmana, uh, and he has uh, accepted a prostitute's wife and to maintain health he was doing all sorts of uh, uh, sinful activities. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting example that Ajamila, before uh, meeting the Yamaduras, before his experience with the Yamaduras, he was uh, not following any religious principles, he was sinful. It wasn't like he, but it wasn't like he took up these activities just to, it wasn't like he gave up his religious principles to save the body, he gave them up for sinful for sinful purposes, for sense gratification. He became a karmi, right? Instead of a brahmana, he gave up being a brahmana to become a, 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 a vikarmi, a sinful man, to act against all the principles of religion. It wasn't like he was in a situation where he was doing it just to save his body. He was just doing it for sense gratification. That was his only thought. He just wanted to satisfy his senses. But of course, yeah, in some ways it was true, he didn't maintain his body. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Think of any other example? Yes? Now, Ravana also, he gave up his religious principle and he wanted to save his body, so he built a fort in Lanka. Ravana, he was a he was a brahmana, right? Yes, Maharaj. Then he gave up. What religious principles did he give up? All his religious principles to build to develop Lanka, to make himself the king king of Lanka. He gave up being a brahmana to become a kshatriya, almost like the king. He was ruling Lanka. Is that your point? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. King Vena, also because of his atrocities, he was very cruel and he was doing only sense gratification. He was not, he, he didn't do, he didn't respect anyone, elders, saints, and to his citizens also, he didn't give any, he didn't follow any dharma also, real religious principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's another vikarmi. He was just, just a sinful person. Yes, to protect the body. I was thinking like, uh, you, you, you may be in a situation where somebody is uh, they're, they're trying to convert you into another belief. And well, we see, for example, like Haridas Thakur, Haridas Thakur, when he was arrested, he was taken to the before the Muhammadan 
magistrate and the Mohammedan man magistrate told him that he should just give up the chanting of the holy na of the names of the Hindu God and he should chant the names of Allah and chant the Quran and he would be safe and he'd be all right and the, ma and the magistrate would let him go. But Haridas Thakur didn't want to do that. He didn't want to give up his religious principles. Even he was willing even to sacrifice his body. And he, of course, he was beaten in the 22 marketplaces. So he risked that. He risked his body rather than give up his religious principles. But someone else who has not got such strong faith, they would certainly want to give up their religious principles rather than uh, lose their faith. I heard during the times of Aurangzeb, Aurangzeb, of course, he wanted many Brahmin threads offered. And they would go to the Brahmanas in the times of Aurangzeb and they would say, either you take the Quran or you take the sword. And if they did not take the Quran, then the sword would come down on their neck and they would cut their head off, right? So some people, they would sacrifice their religious principles, they would take the Qur'an, they would give up their religious principles to take the Qur'an rather than lose their life, to protect their body. Something like this. So that kind of criterion is there, that you want, to, you want to save the body at all costs and you give up your religious principles. Even you may have deities in the house, the house is on fire, you want to save the deities, but you've got to get out of the house, it's a, your life is at stake. You have to go, go out, you may have to leave the deities in the fire, in the house. So you give up your religious principles to save the body. material possessions, they're least important. Religious principles are more important, but most important of all, the material body. We want to protect that body. Anyway, this is what Dadichi is saying. In this way, Dadichi is playing with the demigods. He's telling them, you know, the body, that's the thing we're most attached to. How I can give up my body to you? So how do the demigods respond? It's mentioned here in text 5. And they say, Oh, exalted Brahman, pious persons like you, whose activities are praiseworthy, very kind and affectionate to people in general. What can such pious souls give for the benefit of others? They can give everything, including their bodies. <laughs> The demigods are telling him, they're encouraging him. No, you're so pious, you can, give, you can give your body, even your body you can give, because you're a very pious soul. Hmm. And the demigods go on, and they talk about begging. It's very interesting. They talk about uh, that, that when a beggar comes, that we should understand the difficulty which the beggar may go, be going through in approaching people to ask for charity. Sometimes we don't really understand, we don't appreciate that when beggars come, that it's difficult for them, for some people. Of course, some people are professional beggars, they're really good at it and they know how to get the money in. Other people, it's more difficult. Sometimes I see people when they go for Sankirtan, sometimes you have a new devotee that you want to take him out on book distribution and they have a very difficult time to approach people and to ask people to buy a book and give a donation. They can give the books out freely, but to get money for the books, that's a different thing. People don't off many people, they don't like to ask people for money. So it's difficult. So this point is made here by the demigods. They're telling Dadichi, you know, it's difficult. We're asking you to give your bones. It's not easy for us to ask you. And we know also it's not easy for you. Just like 
if you if you go and beg some if you sometimes the beggar comes and he will ask a person who is in difficulty who has he's, he has uh, economic problems himself so he's not really able to give any charity himself so it's difficult sometimes it's difficult to ask and sometimes it's difficult to give but the the, the culture is as mentioned in the purport here the culture is that a beggar should not ask charity from a person who is in difficulty. In other words, a beggar shouldn't go to people who are poor. Of course, you don't always know who's in poor. You don't, you don't know who's in difficulty. But this is a principle. And also, one who is able to give charity should not deny a beggar. And if, you, if, if, we, if we have something to give, we should give it. We shouldn't deny people. Beggars come, should give something, right? That's the very culture. If we don't give, it's not very good for us. If we have, if we have sufficient and we don't, and somebody comes begging, we should give. Prabhupada tells the story, even the, the sadhu came to the house and the woman didn't want to give anything. But then she said, okay, I'll give you ashes. Ashes, you know, ashes are some, just some useless thing. But the beggar said, oh yes, ashes, okay, give me ashes. <laughs> so the woman went and got some ashes and she gave the ashes to the beggar. And the beggar was satisfied because he thought, she's giving, she started to give something. So this is good. <laughs> Even she gives something which is useless, like ashes. But because she's giving something, it's very good. Anyway, uh, Prabhupada takes up an important point at the end of the purport here. It's very important. Uh, he talks about how the Krishna consciousness movement needs many exalted, learned persons who will sacrifice their lives to revive Krishna consciousness throughout the world. Well, it's very, very wonderful. Yeah. Of course, we may say, well, I'm not qualified. You want exalted, learned person. I'm not exalted, I'm not learned. Oh, no. <laughs> but, but Prabhupada said, we therefore invite all men and women advanced in knowledge to join the Krishna Consciousness Movement, sacrifice their lives for the great cause of reviving the God Consciousness of human society. Very interesting, you know, they were talking about uh, the need, you know, the, the demigods are coming and they're begging Dadichi, we need this, you know. So Prabhupada said, the, the whole world is in need. There's a, a great need in the whole world. The godless civilization. It's a very dangerous position, right? The entire world is in a dangerous position under the spell of a godless civilization. So this is very much Prabhupada's mood and mission, right? He wants people to sacrifice their life to take up Krishna Consciousness and to help to distribute this message of Krishna Consciousness all over the world. Because the world is in danger. It's in a very dangerous position. No God Consciousness. We have to give them some God Consciousness. And Prabhupada is asking all uh, young men, uh, invite all all men and women, and he doesn't say young, he says all, all men and women, so young and old, women and children, men, women and children, everyone, they should join this Krishna Consciousness Movement and help to distribute God Consciousness all over the world. Yeah, it's, it's really important uh, to get this mood, the mood of uh, delivering this message of Krishna Consciousness to the world. 
how much Prabhupada wanted this to be done, that we would sacrifice our life, at least some part of our life. Maybe not your whole life, but you, get, you want to give some time for the service of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. We see in other traditions, you know, for example, Christianity, they have missionaries, they go to different parts of the world and they go there and they'll stay there and they'll make their church and they'll preach there for some time. And then there's a, a religion in America, I don't know if you've heard of it, they're called Mormon. And they have missionaries who go to many different parts of the world. And usually they're quite, not very old, they're usually in their 20s or 30s. And they go to the, these foreign countries, they go in twos and threes and, and they, they, spend, they spend a few years there in these countries. And after they've done the missionary work, then they go back to America and then they, they, because they've spent time as a missionary overseas, they're given free education. Their college education is sponsored. And they come back, they, got, they get their college education, and then they get married, and they get their, into family life, and they settle down. So, very well-organized, structured missionary activities. We need also like that in our Krishna Consciousness Movement. You know, generally what happens with our Krishna Consciousness Movement, you know, we get people, that come, we're expected to give our whole lives. But not everybody can give their whole life. You get people to come for a few years, it can be a great boost for the missionary work, to develop some congregation, try to bring people into the Krishna Consciousness Movement. So Prabhupada, just like when Prabhupada uh, came back to India from America, he'd been in America for some time, began the Krishna Consciousness Movement, then he came back to India, he brought some Westerners with him, a number of them. He had like, he called it his World Sankirtan Party. And there was about 15 or 20 people with him, all in their 20s. I mean, some, many of them married, even a child was with them. And they travelled with Prabhupada in India, and they began the Krishna Consciousness Movement in India. So because they, they, did, they did very good preaching, and they were very impressive. So many important people joined and took to the Krishna Consciousness Movement. And Prabhupada had been trying on his own without success. But when he brought people from the West, then the Indian people were interested. So Prabhupada utilized the Western bodies to come and preach in the East. So Prabhupada is appreciating this, the need, you know, to get missionary workers, preachers, that they will sacrifice their lives, take up this work, to go around and to distribute the message of Krishna to the people all over the world. Introducing Krishna consciousness, you know, there's countries where they don't know about Krishna, we have to introduce Krishna to them. We know when the devotees went to Russia, in the beginning Prabhupada had gone to Russia, 1971, and then Prabhupada told devotees they should also go, and after that Gopal Krishna Maharaj began to go and other people. And they used to send the books, and at that time Russia was a socialist, communist country, and they didn't want Hare Krishna movement. And at one point even they said Hare Krishna movement was one of the biggest threats to the Soviet regime. They didn't like Hare Krishna movement, they wanted it, it was banned. 
they said there were three threats to the Hari, to the to the Russian country, to the the socialist country. The three th threats were one of them was the rock music of the Beatles, the second thing was Coca Cola, and the third thing was Hare Krishna movement. So those three, th they, this was the threats against the <laughs> Russian movement. So. Some places it's more difficult, some countries are more difficult than others. Some countries are open and some are not. Some governments are very demoniac. <laughs> you have to face them, you have to deal with them, not easy. But still, we need people to sacrifice their lives, to go everywhere. You don't, maybe you don't need to go to a foreign country and just in, in our own countries, you can find new places to open up preaching and to develop the preaching movement. Hmm? So, it's, it's like this, it's just like you, Prabhupada is asking for something, it's difficult for people to do because we're very attached to the body. Just like the beggar comes, beggar is asking, can you give donation, give me money? And if you're poor, you don't have any money or you're in difficulty, it's hard to give. But if you have, you should give. In the same way, somebody who has a healthy body and who is intelligent, knowledge, they should use their life for Krishna consciousness. Don't waste the life just working for sense gratification. All right. So Dadichi, uh, he just wanted to hear about religious principles. So he he had heard from these demigods, the great sage Dadichi. He said, just to hear about religious principle. I refuse to offer my body at your request. Now, although my body is extremely dear to me, I must give it up for your better purpose, since I know that it will lead me today or tomorrow. This is intelligence. The body is going to leave us today or tomorrow. Nobody can say, no, no, I'm going, my body won't leave me, I will live forever. That's not going to happen. The body's going to leave us one day, either today or tomorrow, very soon. We don't have control over it. So Dadichi is an intelligent man, very rich in austerity and very knowledgeable. So he's ready to give up his body. And then he, he addresses the demigods, he says, One who has no compassion for humanity in, in, in the suffering and does not sacrifice the, imper the, Im does not sacrifice the impermanent body for the higher causes of religious principles or eternal glory, is certainly pitied even by the immovable beings. So, Dadichi is saying, if you don't show compassion for people suffering, you don't have any feelings about others when you see people suffering, then you're not a very great, you're not a very good person. They won't sacrifice their body for the, higher, per, for the higher causes of religious principles or for glory. They don't want to be glorious. They're not willing to make any sacrifice for others. Then this person is pitied. We feel sorry for him. We feel sorry for him that he has this, he's so selfish. So Prabhupada gives a, quite a long purport from this verse and he talks about Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 
and the Goswamis of Vrindavan and how they sacrificed, how they gave up everything for the service of the Lord. Right? The teachings of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are based on two things, Vairagya and Vidya. Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga Shikshata Eka Purusha Purana Shri Krishna Chaitanya Sharira Dari Kripam Budir Yastvam Maham Prapadye Vairagya, detachment and vidya, learning or knowledge, this is the basis of Bhakti Yoga. Lord Chaitanya came to show us these things. Lord Chaitanya took sannyas at the age of 24. Then he gave, a, gave up his young wife and she was very beautiful and she was not nagging, she was not always yelling and quarrelling with him. She was a very beautiful young woman and she was very peaceful and good qualities, very shy. Actually tomorrow is Vasant Panchami and tomorrow is the uh, uh, appearance day of Vishnu Priya Devi. Vishnu Priya is the name of the second wife of Lord Chaitanya. But Lord Chaitanya took sannyas at the age of 24 and they had no issue. And he left his young wife with his elderly mother. And his elderly mother was also another very great saintly lady, Sachimata. She was a widow. Jagannath Mishra had left the body. And so Lord Chaitanya was taking care of his elderly mother and his young wife and there was no child. And Lord Chaitanya left to take sannyas. Now people, some less intelligent people, they say, oh this is not very good, he shouldn't do that. But for the higher purpose, to teach people, to show people, if you stay at home, how much, what can you do? How many people can you deliver? Lord Chaitanya had to go out from the house. And then Prabhupada talks about the Goswamis, how the Goswamis also, they left their home. They were all wealthy men, big ministers in the government, and they left everything to go to join Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. And look what was Lord Chaitanya's movement at that time. They had nothing. They had no centers. They had no temples. But the Goswamis went to Vrindavan. They stayed there. They built temples, wonderful temples. The Govindaji temple, Madan Mohan temple. Wonderful, wonderful temples. All constructed. Who sent Krishna arranged? And, and then they got the... Lord Chaitanya came there and discovered Radha Kund and Radha Kund, people gave money to renovate, to make the nice Radha Kund. But, but initially there was nothing. They were just staying in Vrindavan, it was just a forest, just a jungle. There were no temples, no deities, no pilgrims and the Goswamis were living there with the wild animals. We complain, oh, we want to, where are the temples? We want to see the big buildings. And, but Lord Chaitanya's time, there was nothing. They developed everything. Krishna sent everything for the benefit of the Krishna consciousness movement. So, that is the missionary spirit. That is the mood which should be there. Hmm? So we, we will ask you, what is the motivation there behind a, for, a, a, for a preacher? What is it that motivates somebody to preach Krishna consciousness? Can you, based on these verses, like we, we see here, number six to number eight, 
Can you just look through the purpose and just tell me what do you think, what is it that really motivates a person to want to preach Krishna consciousness? Anybody? Hare Krishna. Maharaj, it is basically the compassion. And the most important thing is that one should have also had experienced such a compassion from someone else. And then when he realizes that this is the most important uh, service that one can render, not just only to please the Lord, but importantly also to elevate this soul and give him an opportunity to Krishna. So, such a in, very deep heart and compassion. Just like your good self, you are preaching to the entire world, giving your students the opportunity. Otherwise, at this right age, you could also have relaxed in your own places, but yet unmindful of all the material bodily discomforts, you, beyond time zones, you as Buddha, as the most compassionate, you are preaching this. Because you got the greatest benefit of uh, receiving this from Srila Prabhupada and his associates. So similarly, you have the desire that this should be transferred to the others. So when such a heartfelt compassion is experienced, and when the touch of Krishna is realized through such preaching moment, one becomes extremely uh, surcharged to give that. And that's what is the actual motivating fear, a uh, fact. And behind that, that pleases the Lord Supreme Christ, uh, Lord Sri Krishna and the Guru Parampara. So that is the prayerful mood, but basically the compassion which drives a person to become a preacher. Okay, that's very nice. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, that compassion has to be there, that mood of compassion. Uh, we can see talking about uh, compassion for humanity in its suffering that we have to see how people are suffering for the lack of Krishna consciousness and how if we can how we can actually benefit people by giving them Krishna consciousness bringing them to a better uh, position a better understanding of life that's important for us that we want to feel that we can contribute something to the to the people in general. We have something to give them. Prabhupada quotes from the Goswami Astikam this uh, Dina Ganesha ko Karunaya Kopina Kanshasrito like that. Gopi Bhava Ritham Ritadilahari. The Goswamis of Vrindavan that they were not just only in the mood of the gopis but they were really genuinely compassionate on the people and they were thinking of the welfare of the people and that's why they were living in Vrindavan and they were researching the scriptures and st studying the scriptures and writing the shastras, writing the bhakti shastras for the benefit of the conditioned souls that people in the future could come and read them books like Chaitanya Charit Amrita and Brihad Bhagavat Amrita and so many Bhakti Rasa Amrita Sindhu, different Pari Bhakti, so many different books were written by these Goswamis and the, the, these books were all based on authoritative scriptures. And why did they write these books? Not to make money for themselves or not to get any name or fame. But they wanted to give this knowledge, to share their realizations with the people, with the, those people who were willing to read and just take advantage of the treasure of the Vedic wisdom. So nowadays we try to get people to read, you know, in the times of the Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I'm sure it was the same problem. Not everybody would be able to read. Not everyone had education. Some people were well educated, but not everybody. And there was no book distribution, of course. Any book was copied. 
You wanted a book, you had to write it, you had to copy it out. And they had men, people also, who would copy. But people would hear. They would sit down and they would hear. People would read and they could sit and hear. And in this way they could hear the message of the scriptures. So, I've taken a, a little bit from Prabhupada's purports here to bring to your attention. Similarly, everyone else with a materially comfortable condition in this world should join the Krishna Consciousness Movement to elevate the fallen souls. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about if you're in a materially comfortable condition, it's good for you to give it up and to join the Krishna Consciousness Movement. He said one should join the Krishna Consciousness Movement following the examples of such great personalities as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the Goswamis and before them the great sage Dadichi, instead of wasting one's life for temporary bodily comforts one should always be prepared to give up one's life for better causes. After all, the body will be destroyed. Therefore, one should sacrifice it for the glory of distributing religious principles throughout the world. So this is the Krishna Consciousness Movement. We're distributing the religious principles the ultimate religious principle, to surrender to Krishna, right? When we distribute Bhagavad Gita's, we were hearing how the devotees in USA this year, they somehow, although the COVID was there and lockdowns and so many things, somehow they managed to distribute two million Bhagavad Gita's in six weeks. Two million copies of the Bhagavad Gita were distributed over a six-week period. But it's really good. It's good for us, two million copies. It's not small. Quite, of course, the Bible, they go much more, but Bhagavad Gita is, you know, it's still, people are learning, they're getting to know more about the Bhagavad Gita. So it's, it's certainly progressing that uh, people, more and more people are getting a chance to hear about religious principles. And the ultimate religious principle in the Bhagavad Gita, to surrender to Krishna. So we're very happy to hear like that. Okay, so Dadichi is talking, uh, talking about, said, to see other people unhappy we should also be unhappy. You know, unfortunately, when we see un people unhappy, there's certain people, they feel happy to see other people unhappy. But a devotee, when he sees people unhappy, he will feel unhappy. And when he sees people happy, he will feel happy. But materialistic, conditioned souls, they're the other way around. When they see people happy, they're not happy. They don't like it. They don't like to see other people happy. They like to see other people suffering. They think, look at that, look at him. And this, they, this way they scorn at people. So how a devotee should be, how we should think. We should feel compassion, we should feel genuine concern for the welfare of others how we can actually bring them out of their ignorant condition. So we have to feel the happiness and the distress of others as our own. Prabhupada would like to see devotees all happy, especially devotees should be happy because they are in Krishna consciousness. Right? Prabhupada said, if you're not, in, if you're not, if you are morose, then you are not in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> if you're morose, another, if you're not happy, then you're not in Krishna consciousness. So devotees should be joyful. Prabhupada always liked to see the, devotees, the smiling faces 
important. So the, this very powerful section of the Bhagavatam, hearing about Dadichi and how he's uh, preaching to the demigods and telling them about the temporary nature of the body and the importance of working and acting for the benefit of others and not just thinking about ourselves. If one can do something to benefit others, then one should do it. If we can somehow help others in a, in a spiritual sense, bringing them to a higher consciousness, then we definitely want to do it. Prabhupada says here at the end of the purport, a Vaishnava is paradukha dukhi, always unhappy to see the conditioned souls in an unhappy state of materialism. Therefore a Vaishnava is always busy preaching Krishna consciousness throughout the world. This was Prabhupada's program, traveling, preaching, keep moving, right? He says, uh, a rolling stone gathers no moss. That's what he said, it's good, keep moving, keep traveling, you won't get entangled. Narada Muni was cursed by Daksha, he could only stay three days in one place, he thought this is very good, I won't get attached. In the same way, Prabhupada said, a rolling stone gathers no moss. He encouraged the sannyasis, keep traveling, preaching. Of course, this year, this past two years, it's been very difficult. But preaching is going on, although traveling is maybe not so much, not much, but the preaching is going on. So, Dadichi is still speaking about the body, how it's only good for a short time, at any moment it will perish and everything has to be given up, the body, its possessions, riches, relatives, they should all be used for the benefit of others. And Prabhupada in the purport quotes that famous verse from the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, right, 10th canto, where Krishna was, <laughs> Krishna had just been uh, what happened, there was a, the, the Yagna Patnis, the Brahmanas wouldn't give any charity. Then Krishna began to glorify the trees. And at that time this, this verse is quoted, how it, it's the duty of every living being to perform welfare activities for the benefit of others with his life, wealth, intelligence and words. So best is to give your life. If you can give your life, that's the highest. If you can't give your life, then you should give your wealth, give your money for the service of the Krishna consciousness movement. And some if you may say, well, I don't have any money. Okay, then give your intelligence, use your intelligence for the service of Krishna. And you may say, well, I am stupid, I have no good brain. Then use your words, at least chant Hare Krishna, right? At least chant and say something nice about Krishna. In this way, something, you must do something for the service of others. And for the service of others means for our Krishna consciousness movement. So Prabhupada said, this is the mission of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Hmm? And Prabhupada quotes the verse which was often quoted, which was quoted by Lord Chaitanya. Bharata bhumite haila manusha jamad. If you're born in Bharat Vars, it's a good birth, very special birth. Make your life successful. And then Bharata bhumite haila manusha jamad. Janma sartaka kari kara para upaka. So para upaka for others' benefit. You think about others, don't just think about yourself. So Lord Chaitanya always talked about this, do things for the benefit of others. Humanitarian work, that's on the bodily platform, that's only going to be temporary beneficial. Prabhupada said, humanitarian work without Krishna is nothing. Krishna must be brought to the center of all of our activities, 
Otherwise, no activity will have value. Now, how are you going to present the need of Krishna consciousness? If you bring someone to the temple and somebody's talking about humanitarian work is no good, it's useless, we don't, you know, we're not in favor of this humanitarian work. How are we going to uh, present to people that this humanitarian work is not so important? that what's really important is spiritual activities. Any thoughts on this? How can you present this to a modern-day audience? Because the modern-day audience, people are very much in the bodily concept of life. So how are we going to present the need for spiritual activities to them? Any thoughts on this? If you have to give a talk, the Sunday feast, and you have a lot of new devotees there, and they're all thinking about humanitarian work, Yes? Uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Yeah, uh, maybe we can, uh, like Guru Maharaj start to tell that uh, no matter what they do for the body, it's eventually going to just uh, finish. So whatever they are doing is just temporarily doing something good to something which is meant to come to an end. Okay. So, so in, in that way, uh, like rather the soul moves on and then if they invest there, then they will be providing a lasting benefit. But on, on the body, it's, 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 gonna, it's gonna surely come to an end no matter what one does. Alright, can you give some examples? What kind of examples would you give? Like Guru Maharaj uh, setting up hospitals. So, so no matter how many hospitals we have, eventually they only provide some temporary relief, but, but no hospital has actually overcome the complete problem of disease or the complete problem of death altogether. Okay, yeah. And, and, and even we can tell Guru Maharaj that uh, by our, we, are, like, we can tell them like we are actually suffering due to ignorance. So just treating the result of the suffering does not stop further suffering because as long as one is ignorant, he will again do wrong actions. So, we will eventually not be able to end suffering by that way. Okay. So, when we give them the knowledge of right action, then the reaction won't come. So, like Srila Prabhupada would say that still there is poverty in USA. You know, they tell me in India that USA is a rich country, but I still find people on the road because it's their karma to suffer. So. Despite of being in a rich, rich country, they will suffer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. People think there's no suffering, no poverty. <laughs> yes? Maharaj? Yes? Uh, adding to Nankishore Prabhu, uh, compassion for a dress of a drowning person is useless. First, we appreciate their humanitarian work. Yeah, it's very good. But, See, that only benefit the temporary, okay? Now, you build a hospital, yes, it will only give you, give one a temporary relief. Hmm? Whereas, you know, we cannot overcome the death. Like for classic example, we can give at that moment is Corona. So we have such a great hospitals, but what the, what those doctors are doing to overcome this Corona? And also other example, we think in this part of world, uh, Maharaj, like, you know, people come in search of jobs here. So what we can do is, you know, uh, like uh, doing this charity work is, is something like a person who came in search of a job. So instead of getting a job, what we are doing, just we are uh, making him lazy by providing his needs. We call him for, uh, uh, you know, breakfast, lunch, we provide all those things. Uh, on the contrary, when he does that, he will totally forget what is why he has come here instead if we get a job 
at least he, he can stand. Similarly, uh, if we give the Krishna consciousness, this is the eternal religious principle where he can go back to Godhead and you know he can himself overcome all the difficult under the guidance of Vaishnavas, Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. Mm. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Yes, Prabhupada said, you know. Yes, somebody else, yes? Yes, Maharaj. I could probably draw a parallel from Bhagavad Gita 325, 326, where Krishna actually gives this as an instruction. Uh, he says in the purport, a Krishna conscious person does not do anything which is not conducive to the development of Krishna consciousness. He may even act exactly like the ignorant person who is too much attached to material activities. But one is engaged in such activities for the satisfaction of his sense gratification, whereas the other is engaged for the satisfaction of Krishna. And uh, furthermore, he says that therefore the Krishna conscious person is required to show the people how to act and how to engage the results of action for the purpose of Krishna consciousness. In uh, 20, verse 26, he further says in the purport, Therefore, a realized soul in Krishna consciousness should not disturb others in their activities or understanding, but he should act by showing how the results of all work can be dedicated to the service of Krishna. That means he, uh, one should actually train the other people by dovetailing their actions into Krishna consciousness. The learned Krishna conscious person may act in such a way that the ignorant person working for sense gratification may learn how to act and how to behave. Although the ignorant man is not to be disturbed in his activities, a slightly developed Krishna conscious person may directly be engaged in the service of the Lord without waiting for other, other Vedic formulas. So, depending upon the level of one's consciousness, one's activities, one's inclination, a Krishna conscious devotee should engage the common man according to his propensity without disturbing, but yet dovetailing it in the service of Krishna. This will encourage them because they don't need to uh, identify themselves with respect to a particular cult, but their own activities itself gives an opportunity for them to become purified. Okay. So your 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 point is that the devotee needs to work himself, and but be, this way be an example for others. That's, that's one point. At the same time, the devotee should also engage the others on whom he takes compassion and without disturbing their activities, dovetail those activities, their propensities into the service of Krishna oh. and show them how those results can be dedicated to Krishna and how it's going to be all purified for them. Um, bring them also into devotional, into the devotional line. Yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, very nice, interesting. Great challenge, of course. <laughs> how to do this, how to get the, the, the layman or the non-devotees, how to get them into Krishna consciousness. We're always thinking of new ideas, how to bring people into Krishna consciousness. It's, uh, it's always on our minds. We, we see our Krishna consciousness movement, did, huh? we have had some success in bringing people in. Well, it seems to vary, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not so good. Some places, you know, for a long time in India we had a lot of trouble to get people to join and then went through a very good time, they got a lot of people joining and recently, more recently, less and less people joining. Economic development has a lot to do with it, you know. When the country is very economically prosperous and people want more to go into, look for jobs and work and make money. During, in America for example, when Prabhupada was in America, the war was in there. There was a Vietnam War and young people were running away from that. So they came to Krishna Consciousness, it was a shelter from that. Okay, anyway, humanitarian work is a, certainly, it, it's uh, got a lot of people 
supporting it. Many people, you know, you want, if you do humanitarian work, you feed the poor, you get a lot of support. Many people would donate. Even you take care of the cows, you get a lot of support. People are very sympathetic, they want to donate for the cows. You ask people to help distribute Krishna consciousness, book distribution, you don't get so much support. It's more difficult to get people to take an interest in the educational aspect of spiritual knowledge. It's easier for people to give food, cook food, give food, or give medical help, give shelter, these things. But give spiritual knowledge, that's more difficult. That's a real challenge to get people to want to hear, to get people to just take up this philosophy, accept this knowledge. This, this is the para upakar anyway, which Lord Chaitanya wants. Lord Chaitanya wants us to preach Krishna consciousness everywhere. And that is real compassion. Okay, so Sukadeva Goswami is describing about Dadichi and he describes how Dadichi gave up his body. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada describes how Dadichi gave up his body. In the, uh, similar to Dhritarashtra, it's described, it was similar to Dhritarashtra. As Dhritarashtra in the first canto, you heard about Dhritarashtra giving up his body. So Dadichi did, did the same thing. The different elements of the body, the gross elements, he put back into the Mahatattva, where the, the reservoir of all the different elements were. And in this way he, he was freed of the material body. And freeing the soul from the material body, he was able to develop his spiritual form. And in his spiritual form, he was able to transfer himself back to Godhead. At the same time, he fixed himself at the lotus feet of the Lord. So, important for us uh, to understand that he, he, when he gives up the material body, it's not that he's going to merge into the Brahman and lose his individuality. The Mayavadis, they will, of course, they like this kind of explain this kind of talk about giving up the body and the, giving up the element, the material body and then freeing, liberating the soul and they will talk about becoming one and entering into the Brahman and merging into the oneness. But as devotees we don't accept that and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is never encourage this kind of talk. This is Mayavadi Bhashya. And Mayavadi Bhashya, Mayavadi Aparadi. So how do you deal with the Mayavadis when you are presented with the Mayavadi philosophy? And they talk about becoming one and merging and becoming a self, one with the Brahman. What is some of our Vaishnava arguments against the Mayavadi philosophy. Can some, would you like to give me one? Maybe you can, you, you can think of one idea, one maybe. You know, as far as slokas, if you're giving slokas, you cannot give from Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavatam. You have to give from Vedas. You have to give a Vedic verse against the Mayavadi philosophy. Because many of these Mayavadis are Vedantists and they don't accept Bhagavad Gita, they don't accept Bhagavatam. So, what are some good verses to counter Mayavadi philosophy? Are good arguments, good examples, 
Yes, that's a very good one. It's a very good verse. Amongst all eternals, there's one supreme eternal being. And amongst all conscious entities, there's one supreme conscious entity. And that one supreme Lord is providing the needs of everyone. So this is a very good verse to give for the Mayavadis. Any other verse or examples you can think of? Well, they want, Mayavadis are not going to accept Chaitanya Charitamrita. Yes. Bhagavad Gita second chapter, Natve Vaham Chatana Yeah, but I said I didn't want Bhagavad Gita, right? Because we're preaching to Mayavadis, we're preaching against Mayavadi philosophy. All right. In the purport, Prabhupada talks, they talk about uh, the Ram, Ramanuja philosophy that is mentioned in Ramanuja. He talks about the, the air in the pot becoming one with the air. When you, open, when you break the pot, then the air from the pot merges with the air. And, but he says, Ramanuja, he's given, he's explained about this. And it's mentioned in the purport here, text 11. Therefore, Sri Ramanuja Swami in his book, Vedanta Tattvasara, has described that this merging of the soul means that after separating himself from the material body, made of eight elements, the individual soul engages himself in devotional service to the Supreme So, and engages himself in devotional service to the Supreme Personality of Godhead in its eternal form. The material cause of the material elements absorbs the material body and the spirit soul assumes its original position. So this is the idea. You get free of the material body, the soul assumes its spiritual position. You develop your spiritual form, either in Vaikuntha or in Goloka, according to your situation. Hare Krishna Maharaj, if I could just add at this point. Yes. Since the Maya, since the Mayavadis uh, look for Vedic versions, and one of their uh, Vedic uh, literature they always look through is the Ishopanishad. In the Ishopanishad, Mantra 17 specifically says of the state of a person after the body perishes. So there, he's, the prayer says that why you anilam, and then it says that kratosmara kratosmara. So please remember, please remember. So, who, to, uh, who are these prayers meant for? Someone who is supreme. Mm -hmm. So, in this way, that particular mantra can actually tell them that this Upanishad is speaking of some higher uh, authority as a person to whom you can plead, and thereby my body principles can be defeated. Okay, very good. Yes, very nice. Yeah, in the issue of Upanishad, the prayers are being offered. So, who, who, when we offer prayers, anybody who offers prayers, Mayavadis also offer prayers, you know. Who do they offer prayers to? There must be somebody there to hear the prayer. Very nice. So, Maharaj, yeah. uh, adding to Ramakrishna Prabhupada, again from the same verse, we can quote the 15th verse also from Ishwapanishad. Hmm? where uh, the devotees are asking, please remove your effulgence. Uh -huh. Yes, indicating the Lord is a person, that he's not just simply energy, he's not just some impersonal form, but he's a person. He said, I want haranmayena patrena satyasyapitamukam, 
right? Mukam, I want to see your face. Kindly move this Haran Maya, this dazzling effulgence, and exhibit yourself to your devotee. So these are good arguments. Yes, nice. So, yes. Even R.D. Shankaracharya also in his uh, Bajagovindam. <laughs> yes, Bajagovindam. So R.D. Shankara. Of course, the, the Mayavadis are very expert in interpreting that in different ways. You know, we may say Bajagovindam. Govinda means Krishna. They won't say that. They say, no, no, Govinda doesn't mean Krishna. It means something else. Go means the senses, go means the cows, you know. Govinda can be, you know, my varies are very expert word, word jugglers. You know, you, you, you really have a difficult time to convince them. And so, you know, I was surprised also, but it happened to me one time, people would tell me this, Bhaji Govinda, Bhaji Govinda, Krishna, this is not Krishna, no, no, no. <laughs> so be careful. Be ready. <laughs> Maharaj, for them can we say, even uh, Shankaracharya only said, Ekam Shastram Devaki Putra Geetam, Eko Devo Devaki Putra Eva. No? He is clearly addressing who is that person. Hmm? He is the Devaki Putra, he is the son of Devaki. Mm. Yes. <laughs> hmm. I. I don't know how they deal with these things. Of course, that's it's glorification, it's Gita Mahatmya, right? That's Shankaracharya. And Shankaracharya is even, the Jagannath Astikam also comes from Shankaracharya. Jagannatha Swami Nayana Patigani Bhava to me. And so, <laughs> there was. A, Prabhupada says Shankaracharya was a devotee, but you know he had a mission to preach that impersonal philosophy to bewilder the minds of the atheists. Apparently, he changed at some point though in his life that he went through some ch different feeling, different moods, different leanings. Okay, so preaching to Mayavadis is not an easy thing, we sympathize for that. So Tadichi gives up his body, he separates the body from the soul, detached from it, and in this way the, the demigods are able to get the bones from Tadichi. And uh, Maharaj Indra, Indra Maharaj is able to take the bones to uh, he takes the bones to Vishwakarma and Vishwakarma makes a weapon for him. So Indra's got his weapon and he's ready to go into battle. And it's right at the end of the Satya Yuga we're told. The end of the Satya Yuga, beginning of Treta Yuga, a fierce battle took place. And this is during the time of the first, this is the first uh, Manvantara of Vaivishwatamanu. Now we're in the 28th, man, 28th Manvantara. This is the 28th Manvantara. And this battle took place at the time of the first Manvantara. So one Manvantara means the four ages taken together, which is 4,300 million years. And then times 24, and that's how long ago the battle took place. So a very long time, millions of years ago. And then we've get, we're given a lot of information about who's there taking part in the battle. The different demigods are all mentioned. You've got the Rudras, the Vasus, the Adityas, the Ashwini Kumaras. Wow, my goodness, everybody's there, you see? All these different demigods have all come to fight. And they're surrounding Indra. And Indra's on his elephant, Ayurvata. And he's got his 
weapons, the thunderbolt. And then we hear about the different demons and their names are also mentioned. And you've got, as well as you've got demons and you've got demi-demons, yakshas and rakshasas. Rakshasas are men-eaters and <laughs> all kinds of different demons and, and the names, what does it say? The armies of King, which even death personified cannot easily overcome. Okay, anyway, the names are all mentioned and they're how they're, they've got golden ornaments and they've got terrible weapons. They've got clubs and bludgeons and arrows and barbed darts, mallets and lances. Very f vicious weapons which can really harm people and tear people to pieces. So they all come to face each other and the demigods are overwhelmed. The demons throw all their weapons on the demigods. So a big shower of weapons is falling on the demigods. What do the demigods do? They act quickly. They cut the weapons into thousands of pieces in the sky. So the demigods are ready. They, they were able to cut all these weapons to pieces. So they were really prepared for the battle. So the demigods were thwarted with their first attempt throwing the weapons. So after throwing weapons, then they started to, sh to, sh to throw mount the peaks of mountains and trees and stones, using these kinds of things for weapons, for ammunition. But the demigods are so expert and powerful that they also could break these things into pieces as well. Also the demigods, when they saw this, but or rather when the demons saw this, when the demons saw that all their different uh, weapons which they'd been firing at the demigods hadn't had any effect, then the demons were very despondent and they were very discouraged and they thought, oh no, we're not going to win this time. They had defeated the demigods the last time, but they saw this time is going to be different. Even though they've got Vritasura, they're thinking, this is, we don't have a very good situation. So Vritasura saw that the, the soldiers were his, 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 his people, his demons were demoralized because the demigods were not injured at all because they cut all the weapons to pieces. Nothing harmed them. So the demons were really afraid. They thought, oh, this is not good. What are we going to do? Hmm. So, coming up to text number 28. Text number 28 says about an insignificant person uses rough words to cast false, angry accusations against saintly persons. Their fruitless words do not disturb the great personalities. Similarly, all the efforts of the demons against the demigods who were favorably situated under the protection of Krishna were futile. Can you think of some examples where insignificant people use rough words against a great personal against great personalities? Do we have some examples of this? Shrinky to Parikshit Maharaj. Who? The Brahmana but Shrinky to Parikshit Maharaj. The Brahmana, but he cursed Parikshit Maharaj, right? And it did have some effect. <laughs> yeah. we, what, what's said here is that insi insignificant persons, they speak rough words and the, and the saintly persons are not disturbed. They do not disturb the great personalities. 
Krishna Maharaj. Y yes. I can, I can think of the example of uh, Daksha actually trying to curse Lord Shiva or trying to speak uh, ill of uh, Lord Shiva. In the, the in the Daksha sacrifice, so even though he spoke everything, but Lord Shiva remained uh, undisturbed, and finally the effect was that Daksha had to lose his head. Yes. Okay. Lord Shiva was. He didn't recognize Daksha, although Daksha was his father-in-law. Uh, Daksha felt offended and spoke roughly to Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva therefore decided not to come anymore, not to come to the home of Daksha, because he thought so Daksha was not very respectful or not, not having a friendly relationship with him. And then Daksha stopped offering to Lord Shiva. And then you have the war. Then you, the, when, when, oh, well, well, then Uma came. Uma came when Daksha was having a big yagya, and Uma came and then she gave up her body when she saw her father was so rude to, to Lord Shiva. She was disgusted with her father and she gave up her body. And then the followers of Lord Shiva came there and took revenge and they cut off Daksha's head, right, and gave him the head of a goat. But earlier also, there was cursing. There was cursing between the followers of Brihaspati and the followers of Shiva. Right? Brihaspati and the Daksha followers, they were the Brahmanas, and Lord Shiva, his followers, and they cursed each other. The, the followers of Brigu, they cursed. Lord Shiva's followers, they would all become atheists. And the followers of Lord Shiva, they cursed Brigu's people that they would become practitioners of dull rituals. And Prabhupada said, both curses are in effect today. That the followers of Lord Shiva are generally atheists and the Brahmanas do dull rituals with no meaning. So, yes, rough speaking, in, insignificant persons, and, but the saintly person will not be disturbed. Any other examples of this? Hare Krishna Maharaj, even Prahlad Maharaj, uh, he was also saved from his uh, father's demonic activities. Okay. Yeah, certainly Haranyakashipu spoke very rough words to Prahlad Maharaj. <laughs> but Prahlad Maharaj always remained tolerant. He never got disturbed because he was seeing Krishna everywhere. He's a Mahabhagavad. Okay, good example. Thank you. Maharaj Rahugana to Jadabharata. Oh, Maharaj Rahugana to Jadbarat. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. Mah Jad Ma Maharaj Rahugana was ready to beat Jadbarat because he said, you're not carrying my palanquin properly. And he said, I'll have you beaten, I'll whip you. Then you should carry your... Jadbarat was stepping, making sure he didn't step on the insects. And so the palanquin was rocking. Maharaj Rahugan got offended and threatened to beat Jadbarat, and then Jadbarat revealed his transcendental position. He spoke very words of great wisdom, revealing that he was a great personality, that he was in transcendental knowledge. Very good example, yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj, this, uh, again, Daksha Pradhapati is cursing Narada for making his sons. And, uh, to go take the take of the devotional path rather than going to Grihastha like. But Narada, he not reacted for that. That also you can say as example. Daksha cursing Narada Muni. Because Narada Muni made all, all 
Even Narada Muni converted his sons. He got his sons not to go home. Daksha wanted his sons all to get married. Is that the one? His marriage. Yeah, Daksha had first of all 10,000 sons and then 1,000 sons. And Narada Muni made them, he got them all not to go home. He thought they're very nice, renounced people, they don't need to go into family life. And so Daksha was upset and he got really angry at Narada Muni and he cursed Narada Muni. Yes, okay. So Daksha <laughs> speaks rough words. But the saintly person does not get disturbed. We, we, we also have to learn to be tolerant. Sometimes people get angry at us, don't get offended, don't get upset. So Prabhupada writes, similarly, Maharaj, act, yes? Sorry for interrupting, Maharaj. Maharaj, can we say this Amoga's uh, example in uh, Chaitanya Leela? Oh, Amoga, he criticized Lord Chaitanya. That yeah. what kind of sannyasi are you? You have this big opulent feel, mis, a big feast, you eat so much, you're supposed to be renounced. Huh? So harsh words. Then he got reactions, right? Lord Chaitanya didn't get disturbed, but Amoga got reactions, he got cholera or something. And Lord Chaitanya had to come and forgive him. Okay, thank you Prabhu. Duryodhan to who? Vidurji. To Vidur. Oh yeah, he threw Vidur out of the palace, right? Get out. He wanted to beat him. And Vidura saw this as the act of mercy of the Lord, that kicking him out of the palace, he could go and visit the holy places. So Prabhupada says, similarly, accusations made by demonic persons against devotees of Krishna cannot have any effect. The demigods are devotees of Lord Krishna and therefore the curse of the demons were futile. Hmm. Krishna Maharaj, I could also remember two more incidents regarding the curses. One is back again in Chaitanya Lila when uh, uh, Ramananda, who he was uh, trying to correct his uh, spiritual master, uh, <clears throat> uh, that is, uh, the, uh, what do you call that, Madhavendra Puri. So, just before he gave up his body, at that time also Madhavendra Puri was not disturbed. Rather, he was uh, really thinking and praying for him. That was one incident. And another thing is like even Durvasa trying to become very angry with Ambarisha. Yes, Durvasa. Yes, that's a very good example. Durvasa certainly, he was really angry with Ambarish Maharaj. Ambarish Maharaj was very tolerant and Durvasa was the one to suffer. Ambarish didn't suffer at all. Thank you. So we see many examples of this rough speaking and we see also examples of how the devotees tolerate. They, they don't get disturbed, they just, okay, just tolerate. But the asuras, they're not devotees and they're trying to fight here. But here, the asuras who are never devotees of Lord Krishna lost the, their pride in fighting when they found all their endeavours futile. They couldn't have any effect on the demigods. Everything they threw at them was just made into dust. It wasn't harming them. So they decided this is not going to be a good fight. We're, they decided to flee because their prowess had been taken away by the enemy. So they're ready to go, they're running from the, the battlefield, but Vridhasura is there and Vridhasura is not going to run away. Vridhasura is the hero of the Bhagavatam and we'll see why he's a hero, how he responds during the battle. 
And so the army is broken, the Asuras, supposed to be great heroes, they're fleeing from the battlefield. But Vridasura, he's really the hero, and he spoke, he spoke to these people, they're supposed to be his compatriots, they're supposed to fight with him. And he calls back to them, please hear, do not flee. He addresses them, you know, where are you going? What's going on? And he, he gives the example, we have to die. Everybody who takes birth in the material world must die. No one in this world has found any means to be saved from death. So why are you worrying? Better to, it's glorious to die on the battlefield. If one can be promoted to the higher planets, then you're a hero. You die a good death. Better to die a glorious death than to die like cats and dogs, Prabhupada says. So you, we want to have a glorious death, it's very important. Tamal Krishna Maharaj was taking care of Srila Prabhupada in the final year and he was telling Prabhupada the verse from the Bhagavad Gita where Lord Krishna says, to die on the battlefield is glorious. And, and, and Prabhupada said, yes, I want that. He said, I want to die on the battlefield. And, and for Prabhupada, of course, the battlefield was preaching Krishna consciousness. In the Western world particularly, Prabhupada thought that this is a, a glorious death to go on the bat, go out preaching. Never wanted to stop preaching. And we see this, we see this, uh, His Holiness Jaipataka Swami Maharaj constantly preaching every day, constantly wherever he goes, every moment he's preaching. You know, there's not a day when he doesn't give class, and hardly there's a moment when he stops preaching. He's always active, and, and we see this also here with Vritasura. This is the same mood. You know, glory, you, you got to, we got to, we don't want to be a coward. We want to do our duty, do what we're meant to be doing. And it's described here at the end of the chapter, that there are two ways to meet a glorious death, and both are very rare. One is to die after performing mystic yoga, especially bhakti yoga, by which one can control the mind and living force, and die absorbed in thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The second is to die on the battlefield, leading the army, and never showing one's back. These two kinds of deaths are recommended in the Shastra as glorious. So Prabhupada liked very much this, you know, I want to die on the battlefield. And Prabhupada wanted very much like that, encouraged the devotees like that. Uh, if you can give your life in the service of Krishna consciousness, it's a great, Sacrifice is a great blessing. And there are many devotees, they give their life for the service of, they've given their life for the service of the Krishna consciousness movement. And we're seeing it, uh, we're seeing it every, every day practically. People are, you know, leaving the body and they're very long time devotees. Just the other day, a devotee left the body in Vrindavan. One of my god brothers, his name was Vishal. Vishal Prabhu, very seen, he was from Los Angeles. He joined the movement in Los Angeles very early, 1970 or so. And uh, he was a very dedicated book distributor. He joined, well, he left the body the other day, he was 85. Uh, so, he joined the movement, he was in the mid-thirties when he joined the movement. He spent 50 years in Krishna consciousness. And he was very, 
always very good in book distribution. He loved to go out and distribute Prabhupada's books. He would go out the whole day, distribute books and get people to buy books. Nowadays, you know, when people do books, you know, often it's done, they, they have sponsors and people give them money and everything and you, you just give the book out to people and maybe you get a little donation from them or something. But it, in the past, in the old days, you know, we, was, we used to sell the books and people had to pay and we used to cover up the, the cost of the book as well. And so Vishal would do like that, he would do a lot of books. He would get people to give money, he would get people to donate. He was very good. He was not big, he was a small man and he was chubby. <laughs> and he was very, very jovial person. <laughs> and sometimes, I, there was one pastime, I'll just tell you about Vishal because, while well, I'm talking about him because he just left the body a few days ago. But he was in Vrindavan and Prabhupada was there and Prabhupada was a bit angry sometimes, you know, sometimes Prabhupada would get really um, angry that we weren't doing things right and he'd get quite chastising on people, he'd be chastising devotees that don't, you're not taking care of this, you haven't done that right, this is not right. You know, things were not the way Prabhupada wanted. Prabhupada had a lot of clear ideas what he wanted and we couldn't always keep Prabhupada fully happy. So uh, Vishal, one morning Prabhupada was walking around and Prabhupada was finding out things which were not right and was telling the managers, do this, why is that, this is not right. And, and Vishal was there and, 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 <laughs> and Prabhupada came past and Vishal just shouted, Jai Prabhupada! <laughs> And Prabhupada looked at him and said, and you do something useful. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada just told, put him in his place, he said, you do something useful. <laughs> so that, that's one of my memories of Vishal. But he was very much well known to distribute books. And I saw Dinabandhu Prabhu put the notice about his departure uh, Dina Bandhu said he'd been distributing books up to his last day in Vrindavan. That every day he'd be out there and he'd be trying to distribute books to get people to take a book. And so it's a glorious departure, you know. He's in Vrindavan and he's distributing books, trying to preach Krishna consciousness. It's so a very nice. Now just recently here in Mayapur also, a devotee left the body. They gave class in the morning. They gave the Srimad Bhagavatam class. And then the devotee, his name is Shama Jagannath Prabhu. He was originally in the Gulf before coming to Mayapur. So he gave the Bhagavatam classes and he was planning to leave. I think he was going to Bangalore for a visit or something. And he said, I have to stop now. I'm going somewhere. And a half an hour later, he left the body. A heart attack or something, you know, natural causes. But very glorious, you know, it's a real wonderful departure. Dying on the, that's dying on the battlefield, you know. You give a class and half an hour later, you leave the body. It's wonderful, very powerful. So, we have many examples like that in our Krishna consciousness movement devotees, dedicated devotees, how they could uh, die on the battlefield. And other people, mystic yoga, and Prabhupada just simply talks about the mind absorbed in the Supreme Lord. So it may be that you're incapacitated, just like Madhavendra Puri, Madhavendra Puri, it's described he was taken care of by Ishwara Puri and Ishwara Puri was reminding him about Krishna and chanting the holy name. And we saw Srila Prabhupada also when Srila Prabhupada was in his final year, 19, 1977, Prabhupada was, uh, he just wanted to hear the holy name. He wanted kirtan. 
and we would take turns, we had a schedule, usually two devotees would go, just in pairs, and we'd go into Prabhupada's room and we'd chant for Prabhupada, and with, with very small cartels. Sometimes, you know, some people would come, Prabhupada wanted them to chant, like uh, Hansadura, Lokanath Swami, and also uh, Bharadraj Prabhu. Bharadraj Prabhu was a very good kirtanir, his Prabhupada disciple from Los Angeles. He was an artist. He came to visit Prabhupada, and when he, Prabhupada saw him, he, he wanted them to come and do kirtan for him, play harmonium and chant. So that's also mystic yoga, leaving the body in trance, hearing the holy name. That's also a very glorious departure. And so we saw also uh, Gunagrahi Maharaj, one devotee left his body just last year in Vrindavan. Gunagrahi Swami, he was a disciple of Srila Prabhupada. And they had Govinda Maharaj there. You know, he was very close with Govinda Maharaj and many other senior devotees, they were all there and Govinda Maharaj was doing kirtan for him and Govinda Maharaj was just doing kirtan because Gunagrahi Maharaj loved kirtan. They had kirtan for months and months because Gunagrahi Maharaj was sick for a long time and they would have kirtan all the time and he would be there doing kirtan and many devotees would come, they had a lot of kirtan and the day he departed, Govinda Maharaj was there doing kirtan right in front of him. So a wonderful departure, hearing the holy name. This is mystic yoga. So two kinds of glorious departure, right? One is on the battlefield. There's a picture in Jaipur, in the palace in Jaipur, there's a picture. There's two kings are fighting, two Kshatriyas are fighting. And the sword is, the one king has got the sword in him and, and he's pulling that person who's holding the sword, he's pulling him closer so he can get, swipe at him. And Prabhupada said, yes, this is Kshatriya. The Kshatriya will never go back. Even though the sword was in him, he was pulling that person closer to him, which meant the sword was going more in his body, but so he could hit at the other person. He wanted to strike. He didn't want to go back. He said, Kshatriya will not die on the back. To go back, that is not good. That is not, he must die going forward. So, <laughs> Krishna consciousness is like that also. We want to always go forward. We, we don't want to go back. We don't want to diminish. Prabhupada told us, he said, at least you must maintain what I have given. You cannot diminish. You must maintain it. All right. So, any questions or comments on this today? Maharaj, would you also go and chant for Prabhupada in his final days? Yeah, yeah. We were always going in to chant for Prabhupada. Uh, that final day, I was not there that day. The day he departed, I had just gone because we didn't know Prabhupada was going to leave. He'd been sick for some time. So, you know, we didn't know exactly when Prabhupada was going to leave. And I had, I had a Sankirtan vehicle with Sankirtan devotees and I didn't know what to do. And, you know, other people, you know, we were constantly coming and going. So we didn't have any indication that Prabhupada was going to depart. So I missed the actual departure that, that actual day. But several other days we were there chanting. Service of Srila Prabhupada, how he came to US in that such a COVID situation and he kept his body. But the service of Srila Prabhupada, it also reminded me, Maharaj. Yes, yes, definitely. Bhakti Chiruswami, 
rendered wonderful service to Srila Prabhupada for many years. He was a very intimate disciple of Srila Prabhupada and Srila Prabhupada had great love for him. Prabhupada recognized him immediately and gave him sannyas, gave him responsibility. So he was a very dear devotee to Srila Prabhupada and Bhakti Chiraswami maintained his service to Srila Prabhupada throughout 50 years, uh, about 48 years or something. Anyway, many years he was in the movement and rendered wonderful service, very valuable service, very much loved devotee. It's stated in the Garuda Purana that even if one cannot remember Krishna at the time of death, you know, we may die in some situation which is not very conducive, we may not be conscious, but Krishna does not forget the devotee, right? Because somebody has dedicated their lives to Krishna. We, we may not be able to remember. If that devotee who's remembered Krishna throughout their life, somehow at the moment of death he may not be able to, it may be in the condition he's not able to think of Krishna or to hear the holy name, but Krishna does not forget him. And Krishna will take care of that devotee and certainly deliver him back to Godhead. That's stated, that's in the scriptures. So we don't have to doubt, you know, some people say, oh, you know, departure is not very good, it's not devotees, you know, somebody dies in an accident, a motor car crash, or somebody dies in the hospital and unconscious, it's not very good. But we have to understand, these people have given their life for the service of Krishna and have made wonderful contributions to the service of Krishna and they were very dear and their service was very much appreciated by Srila Prabhupada, that certainly there can be no doubt about their situation, how glorious they are and how they have a wonderful destination in the future. Right? Thank you very much, Maharaj. Yes. Maharaj, tomorrow is our glorious Vas Puja day. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Mother Desh, I mean, uh, the devotees of Bhakti Vaibhav students, we pray at the lotus feet of Radha Madhav to give you good health and you continue to, uh, to spread the, uh, to elevate all the fallen souls more and more. And also, please bless us, Maharaj. We remain in uh, Krishna service, like you all dedicated your lives to Srila Prabhupada. Please also bless us. We will also remember uh, Srila Prabhupada and uh, Guru and uh, Goranga till our last breath. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna okay. Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Okay, Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Gore back to Vrinda ki. Hare Krishna.